thank you for being back. We're joined by our chief legal advisor of the division, uh, Dorothy Fountain, who also, with, it's within her unit where the Office of Decree Enforcement is, and she has also been spearheading along with, oh, a good 30, 40 other attorneys, um, the whole consent decree review process. So we're, I'm personally grateful to, for the last at least six, seven months where she has been uh, working, she has uh, created a whole database to digitize these consent decrees that go over 100 years. We're looking at the products, the specific provisions, the courts, uh, the, the duration, the various terms. I think it's going to have incredible, uh, you know, as a part of me that likes to think of myself as an academic, uh, I think it would have incredible value for somebody to look at these once we're through with them and take a look at the history of some of these. Uh, uh, they're not only entertaining, uh, they're, I think, pretty informative. And I think we will learn a lot. Um, let me ask, start where we uh, left off uh, about uh, post-merger studies. Uh, a retrospective, I think, is always useful for us to learn uh, from various remedies we have done. Um, one, the easy answer, I think, is should, should we be doing them? Who should be doing them? How should they be designed? And what should be the elements of such a study uh, from which we and the public could benefit from it and uh, look at uh, what we're doing that might be wrong or what we're doing that's good that we should continue to do? Uh, George, let's start us off. Sure. Um, yeah, I think it's a great idea. Um, I think um, it obviously takes some resources to uh, do a retrospective when you're trying to focus on what's going on now, too. But I think uh, you can learn uh, from that. Um, I think um, who does it um, may not be as important as uh, that it's uh, peer reviewed or peer reviewable so that um, if the agencies are doing it themselves, um, there's somebody who's got access to enough of the same information so that the agency doesn't say, well, we think we've done a really good job and we really can't share with you all of the confidential details that prove that. Um, I think there are people on the outside who would love to be a part of that. And so, um, you know, I, I think your idea of using um, the, uh, what, 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 National Institute of Justice. Yeah, using oh, the, the Office of as Justice a conduit programs. for that um, is one idea. I'm, I know there are people in um, academia who uh, would love to be able to um, do that. Um, John Quoke has already done um, uh, a good um, stab at that, I think, um, and there are others like him who would like to be involved. I think it's important to try to figure out, you know, you go into one of these things and it's all predictive and likely, you know, may, and, um, you know, it's kind of uh, developed into um, a, um, a higher level of uh, proof uh, being required than um, uh, may be, um, you know, intended originally under the law. Um, and uh, the incipiency standard and you're making judgments about what's going to happen and you're letting a merger go through where you have a lot of concerns about it and you're kind of hoping for the best and hoping that you figured it out right and if you didn't it's important to know that. Is a, um, uh, you know, Joel Klein uh, had established on the international front um, the ice pack uh, on international competition, which uh, had a lot of great uh, work that was done at the intersection of trade and antitrust law, um, headed by uh, Jim Rill, former AAG, uh, which, which led to some of the international uh, convergence uh, efforts that we have now and led to the International Competition Network and some of those studies. Um, there was a, both trade lawyers, practitioners, former agency officials. Um, as well as antitrust. Would, a, would something like that, where a public advisory committee established by the division, uh, made up of economists and practitioners, uh, make sense? Or are those, do, do those have, is, or structure like that have a limitation to do that? Uh, 
John, what you? Yeah. So, um, I, 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 I like the idea. Um, it's critical to have balance, uh, you know, ideological balance in these issues uh, in, in particular is an issue that, you know, we struggle with at the ABA and I would think you would, uh, you know, want to take some care on that too. Um, the, the big challenge is going to be the data and making sure that what comes out of it is not purely anecdotal, which, which may be difficult. Uh, but uh, to the extent there can be data that generates some, some macro conclusions, I think that would be awesome. I'm not optimistic that that's possible, but it's something to, uh, to, to strive for. We throw that to our two economists on the, on the panel. You guys know how to come up with data? Well, you, you, what do you, you think? You, you, you mentioned economists, and I was going to say there are two of us in favor of having economists on the panel, so <laughs> at least it. Are you going to let me go first? The, um, <laughs> oh. um, go ahead, um, the, um, So So two things. One is um, you, understanding the effects of all these decrees over time will be important. Um, and, and I think the kind of exercise you're talking about would be very useful in that regard. The, but the other question is um, the process of getting rid of them. Uh, so let's assume out of the 1,300 there are some significant number uh, that just don't make any sense uh, in the modern world. Uh, is there a way to, uh, to do that with, uh, with a presumption? Uh, where you would say if it's more than 50 years old, it's done <laughs> unless someone shows up to complain? Um, and is that a more efficient way of achieving the outcome? Um, the uh, and I say this a little bit jokingly, but you know you could uh, repeal two for every new one you enter into. <laughs> if you wanted to think of it that way, but uh, I think keeping the uh, keeping an eye on the ball of of actually, uh, you know, let's getting the let's get these things retired um, is also important. No, thank you for that, and, and and Dorothy has made sure we stick with it and keep our eye on the ball and moving forward uh, fast. I mean, I don't know if there's a presumption. That's temporal. Um, I'd be a fan of anything that's older than me. Should go away. But uh, consent decrees, that's a joke. But, um, 29 years old. 29 years old. Yeah, 29. Uh, but uh, I, I, you know, I think that we should look at all of them and see if the markets have changed. Um, and then look back to the organic question of, are, are, is this the appropriate role for us? So. So just looping back around to the concept of retrospectives, you know, they can be done not only for merger cases, but yeah. for non-merger non cases, huh. Section 1 and Section 2 cases. I just want to add to something John Jacobson said over here. Um, he obviously raised a major concern about data, who collects it, how is it, how is it made available to any sort of third party that might be helping the DOJ uh, with this study. But I, I, I think there's an even, even bigger problem, and that is, is it's a sampling issue. So what cases do you pick, right? right? So you, you would really, really want to get a very good representative universe of cases that would help that would uh, help inform policy moving forward. So, you know, for example, you'd want cases, um, retrospectives done on, on, um, on um, mergers with and without consent orders, right? You, you would want to um, study both of those types of scenarios. You would particularly want to look at cases, uh, merger cases that occurred in industries where there's been successive consolidation. Telecom and airlines are really good, are really good, um, good candidates for that. Um, so how you structure the sample of retrospectives in the merger space, but also potentially in the Section Two space, and in um, you know Section One's a little different because because of the, you know the, the criminal. Uh, implications as opposed to civil violations, but I, I think those types of well-constructed uh, retrospectives that are part of a well-constructed model for how that vehicle can use be used to inform policy would be really, uh, really, really helpful. And, and you know, we, we, we have a lot of good ones already, and they've been done by academics, and there have been individual retrospectives, and then meta study, you know, meta studies, studies of the studies, and, and so. We, that process is, is, is chunking along very nicely, uh, but some codification and formalization of it would be really useful, I think, in the agency context. That's a good point. Yeah. Slightly different view on that. Um, I think, yeah, surprise, right? Um, 
you know, uh, as you know, the Federal Trade Commission has the ability to conduct studies, you know, uh, by, by mandate and have done that in, in kind of limited capacity. As you know, they've done multiple merger studies, merger remedy studies, most recently last year. Um, it's, it's hard to argue with evidence-based enforcement, right? And so I don't think there's, you know, it's hard to argue that it would be bad to have more data, but I think you have to be very careful as to how ambitious that can be, because you're a law enforcement agency, right? And so it's hard, you're not a, you know, a study agency, uh, and so you have limited resources, and I think it's, you know, it's hard to, I mean, you obviously can design studies and go look at tons of stuff, but um, I don't think you have the resources or time to, to do that, and so I think it's something very targeted and very specific. I also think the data issue is a huge problem, because I don't know how you look at mergers, because I mean, part of it, part of my concern is you're going to third parties and saying, hey, we need data from you. We need you to tell us how the merger went. If, if there was an enforcement action, you got to spend resources and time to, to comply with a subpoena or something like that. And so that has real costs. Um, but also, too, it's very confidential information. And so I don't know how you would do it in some way of, you know, it's not, it's not China, right? We can't just, you know, kind of uh, demand tons of things. But I think there's a, you know, there's a real limitation on what private parties can do to participate in that. And I think I would have a hard time, too, saying, hey, guess what, third party? We're going to have, you know, McKinsey or these other people that you're going to agree to let look at this data, um, and and I would I would have some real concerns about that. At the same time, um, I think there's been some real. Now you could kind of go back to me. I think the the 2017 FTC study was really interesting, and I think was uh, definitely contributed to the body of knowledge on mergers. And so, um, you know, I would definitely encourage there, you know, to be more thought about how to think about getting the evidence in a way that would inform the division going forward. And maybe you could do it with, you know, have the division, you know, get the data and look at it itself and do an analysis that is kept confidential, but some of the non-confidential information is shared with a broader, you know, broader constituents and you know, members of the bar, and obviously a lot of the organizations sitting here uh, might, might be also ones that could, could provide insights on that. Would a simple analysis of HHI changes uh, be at all informative, do you think? I think that's pretty. That's a pretty crude tool, in my in my opinion. Um, I think that as you know, obviously, as you know, uh, a merger's job is to fix the anti-competitive harm that would have occurred, but for the deal, but right. effects from that deal. And so, you can imagine cases where that occurred, the remedy was successful, but HHIs went up for other reasons. You know, market failure. Um, you know, companies buying other companies potentially. So I don't know that that would be enough to really give you too much. And it also depends on how you define the market. There's a lot of a lot of real challenges there. Uh, it may change over time. Yeah. Yep. One, uh, one, one fact that the, the data should be available for that may be relevant to some of this is entry. Um, so, you know, look at, you know, post-conduct or post-merger uh, uh, effects on, on entry. That, that's less difficult. And it doesn't answer all the questions. It doesn't answer price. It doesn't a answer output. But that that is that is something that can be looked at, in, in, you know, in, in I think pretty much every case. So um, one one point I wanted to make, and I make briefly in the written comments, is the Tunney Act requires a competitive impact statement for every consent. Uh, so presumably we have competitive impact statements. Now those are frankly not as substantial as I think they ought to be, um, and that's another topic um, going forward maybe. But looking back, one place to start would be to look at the competitive impact statements. What did it predict, and what happened? Interesting. I had not thought about that. But that's a it's a good good point. I know that Mr. Feldman thinks it's just broad consolidation uh, that should have been stopped in, in the first place. Anything you want to add on this and about if you were going to design a study to examine such con concentration uh, increases, uh, is that something that you would be, you think would be good and, and who should be the best person to do such a thing? Other than the Open Markets Institute, of course. <laughs> Naturally, yeah. Yes, um, yeah, you know, these are all great points that have been discussed. In terms of HHI, I do agree that there are some problems uh, in terms of that as a proxy. I do think it is valuable is that that's a really great way to see if barriers to entry have been raised before the deal and after the consent decree has been imposed. So that's something I would favor. And as well, I think that, um, you know, as we've seen with the work of John Quilka on hospital consolidation, uh, his results showing how the market has shifted from uh, five to four hospitals and that raised prices, uh, then inform the agencies going forward in terms of blocking deals. So I think that they can be very instructive uh, tools. Great. Uh, 
George, your statement mentioned that when using behavioral remedies and merger decrees, since the merger is forever, the behavioral decree provisions should also be perpetual. Um, correct me if I'm we've, in any way we have uh, misstated or embellished upon what your, your view is. Do you think there are limits to the rule to account for the changes in the marketplace, and how should that be implemented? Oh, uh, yes, definitely. And uh, the point that I was making is um, that, you know, having an arbitrary uh, shelf life um, for um, behavioral remedies that are designed to address a structural problem, that the structural problem is forever. And uh, to say that we're going to sunset the behavioral um, protections after a certain period of time leaves the um, leaves the structure uh, problem still in place. So the fact that um, it sounds so strange, um, and I think I also say this in my written statement, the fact that it sounds so strange to talk about um, having uh, behavioral remedies that never end uh, sort of um, uh, points out the, um, the ambitious role that you're seeking for these limited time behavioral uh, remedies to play in fixing a permanent structural problem. Tough to disagree with that. Jeff, you well, don't, don't, about don't, don't, you, have, don't you have to think about the definition of the word permanent there. Um, so if a market is changing rapidly, there's no presumption of permanence to the underlying problem. Uh, and um, and so I, I think the 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 type one, type two error framework here can be, you know, useful. What is the likelihood of uh, a uh, decree over time uh, outliving changes in the marketplace uh, and becoming harmful as opposed to beneficial? Assuming we can design beneficial decree, uh, a decree which is beneficial tomorrow and next week and even next year and even five years from now, at some point the level of certainty. Uh, around that benefit cost analysis has to decay, um, and in some markets maybe faster than others. So, yeah. and and um, uh, that I think is the point that I led with um, is that I uh, this is in the context of having some mechanism for going back after an appropriate period of time and deciding whether the decree uh, is still necessary, whether it's still working effectively, whether it's causing more problems than it's solving, whether it needs to be um, uh, uh, relaxed or altered in some way to be more effective. So I absolutely agree that, um, you know, in my saying uh, that they should be, uh, what, I, what I meant was that you don't, ju you don't start with a time limit on the protections that you are creating to um, take care of what is a permanent uh, problem, which, or or at least a permanent problem until the market evolves. You know, exactly. at some point, you may have a completely different structure in which the decree um, makes no sense. Can I uh, ask the question whether or not something like in the anti-dumping countervailing duty context, where there is a sort of uh, sunset review process, where after a certain period of time, there's automatic review process, and then they decide whether or not they're going to continue with the duty or not? Is that the kind of thing that you're talking about? Potentially, um, although there's a resource issue here, and um, you know the um, the uh, the MFJ, um, you know, almost immediately uh, uh, led to an unending cascade of uh, requests for exceptions. And so, you know, one of the things you have to think about is how often and for how many of these decrees do you do that. Uh, there should be some, uh, I think, minimal. Um, uh, threshold uh, for reconsideration, not just, you know, every year everybody gets a shot to come in and see if they can get out from what they agreed to. But uh, absolutely some uh, mechanism for um, methodically uh, looking at them to make sure they still make sense. So, I don't think this is a one size fits all situation. Um, if you have decrees that, and there are lots of them in, your, in the 1300 and otherwise, that simply <coughs> say stop violating the antitrust laws, don't do it anymore, there's no reason for that to, to, to uh, be perpetual, and, and certainly five years is, is a pretty good presumption for, for, for that length. 
There are other decrees, and these were more common in the past, with fencing in provisions. And those need to be looked at, I think, in, in each case to say, you know, how long do we really think uh, these fencing in uh, provisions uh, provide? The, the, there are others that are more structural, so you, know, you will license this asset today uh, forever. Uh, and uh, there's no reason why, you know, once that license has been signed that that decree needs to continue further than that. So I, I, I think it's a case-by-case -case situation, but, but certainly the, the point that you've been making, which is that there ought to be a heavy presumption against perpetual decrees, is, is correct. And what about, what about Diana has to, do you want to, oh, sorry, go ahead. I think one important, really important point here in terms of finding guiding principles um, for for these types of questions, it, for 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 decrees is is whether the remedies contained therein, whether it be behavioral, structural, or a or a or a, a combo platter, it, whether they've been effective in fully restoring competition. I, I mean, that's the purpose of an antitrust remedy, and uh, and full restoration of competition is the best deterrence that. Um, the, the, that DOJ can find as a law enforcement agency to deter future violations. That, that should be the guiding principle. So if in filing a complaint and, and simultaneously negotiating um, a consent, the DOJ was concerned enough uh, about a violation of the law that a consent went into place and that consent was in place for perhaps 10 years or five years, says something about what the division's concerns were in, in the first place, that, that competition w would be harmed by a transaction or a form of conduct, and that needed to be remedied for a period of, say, 10 years in a, in a consent order. Um, I, I don't think that closes the door on revisiting consent orders in some cases, much like um, requests for um, immunity should be review for the international airline alliances should be reviewed every three years they're not but they should be and dot do we've strongly encouraged dot to to work on that and i think you all have as well but uh, until unless and until the remedy has fully restored competition it should stay in place and i guess the question is you know where the rubber meets the road is how do you determine full restoration of competition while accounting for all of the exogenous factors that spring up around markets and and um, and um, uh, dynamic concepts like innovation and market entry and that sort of thing. I mean, that's the real that's the rub, and that's the difficult part of the of the calculus. So yeah, one question I had is um, the idea of a default period of ten years. Is it is that an appropriate thing to do? Because obviously, it's very fact specific on the market. Is it better to have a situation where there's sort of a baseline expectation of 10 years, but that's a situation that's been negotiated uh, as part of the settlement? If I may, just one more comment on this. I, I think the time period is really critical, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll refer to DOT's uh, reasoning in these, in these grants of immunity for airline alliances. Um, DOT specifically shows a five-year period in the Delta Air Mexico case, as you all know, since you you were involved um, because it was a long enough period of time for infrastructure modifications to be made at both airports and for the companies to be able to plan ahead and engage in pro-competitive expansion and efficiency enhancing activities. If it had been shorter than five years, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, Ten years, uh, probably plenty of time for all of the pro-competitive you know, activities uh, for the company to implement those those kinds of things. It's going to depend on on the markets. At highly dynamic markets, you know, maybe a shorter or even a longer period of time, depending on what you're talking about. Infrastructure markets, traditional markets, y y there's more guidance there based on the division's history. But um, you know, I think those are some of the key considerations that go that go into that. I, I just I completely agree with what's been said in terms of case by case. I mean, I, I just think every market is evolving at a different pace and every problem is different. So an intellectual property licensing solution may be something that can be very temporary in nature. Um, a uh, more structural um, a kind of problem may require a longer, um, a longer period. Yeah. I was just going to say the same thing. I think it's got to be case by case and rather than a hard and fast deadline, you might want to have a presumption or some ability to go back and make sure that um, 
that it's time to get rid of it. And it could be uh, sooner than you expect or it could take longer than you expect for uh, not only the um, competition to be fully restored, but the, um, the risk uh, to competition in the structure of the marketplace be um, satisfactorily uh, resolved. How should we measure those market changes? Uh, is, you know, not a one size fits all, however, what should be the analytical framework to examine the change in the market dynamics that we should apply when we look back? That's really going to be case by case. <laughs> it, it is. I, I think you have to start with the, the basics, you know, entry, price, and output. I think those are the key uh, considerations. They can be very difficult and impossible to, to measure or get data for, but I think going in, those are the three things to, to be looking at. When, when you look at, at future markets, for example, um, you know, Tokyo Electron is so, must have been a lot of fun around here. Um, the um, you know looking at those cases, I think um, your the time period is going to depend a lot on the innovation cycle, right? So you you would think about that differently for a pharmaceutical market, from a steel market, from a car market, from a uh, market for airplane cockpits. To go back to an old case. Yeah, I, I was going to follow up on the, on the innovation part. I mean, if you look at entry, if you look at price. How do we measure the benefit or missing? the innovation because of the decree was in place? Well, you can't. Uh, absent some, you know, extraordinary document somewhere, like the, the man in the gray suit where, you know, all of the textile manufacturers wanted to put him out of business because his suit lasted forever. Um, so it, uh, it, it would depend on the nature of the IP right, the, the nature of the type of, of remedy and license uh, or disposition that we would be required. But in terms of projecting, you know, what innovations, uh, you know, died on the vine because we allowed this deal to go through, I, I don't know how you do that, honestly. Well, I, I actually, I think... Um, I, no, no, you. I mean, we have done it. So, in, in, in the one case, um, if I cite some place and I'm blanking on the uh, case, uh, FTCB PPG Industries, 1986. Uh, this is a case involving airplane, airplane cockpits. There were basically two firms that were innovating. Um, they looked carefully at what was the next product cycle. Uh, what would the impact be if one of the two firms was taken out of the a market for the next generation of product cycle, and we're able to come to some pretty concrete uh, conclusions about that. So I, it, it's intensely fact specific, and it may be in a lot of cases you, you'd be throwing a dart at the wall. But in many cases, you can actually look at the realities of what's happening in the innovation cycle and make some. You know, I think it. I think it's reasonably. It's becoming clearer and clearer where 5G wireless technology is going and how that's going to evolve. It was very foggy 18 months ago. It's less foggy now. It'll be less foggy uh, 12 months from now. So uh, in, in cases like that, there, there's stuff happening and you can predict what's, where it's going to go. Can I just, may, this is all great stuff for sure, but, but I, I think part of the challenge here is to, um, is to develop some sort of tractable, reasonable, defensible framework around which uh, the division would be able to uh, uh, conclude that a uh, decree um, is no longer necessary in a market. And, and I would, and because it's a really good question, what should be measured? What should be looked at? And here I think this is actually one really good application of the structure, conduct, and, perform, and performance paradigm, right? Start with market structure, look at, at entry, look at concentration, all of sort of the basic structural components that economists uh, look to to determine whether markets are conducive to competition or not. And then move to all of the conduct stuff that, 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 is, that flows from that, right? What, what have prices done, for example? How has quality changed over time? Um, uh, it, you know, are firms in differentiated product markets competing hard because we see a lot of advertising and head-to-head -head competition, that sort of thing? And, and then the innovation part really comes in at the end, right? That's the performance part of the deal. So good market structure, Pro-competitive market conduct generally leads to, to innovation and, and, and efficiencies. So, so, you know, the structure conduct performance paradigm is highly controversial. We were joking about it earlier. Well, I don't joke about it, but other people do. Um, but, but it is a very useful construct in, in which 
to, to sort of couch or contextualize an assessment of whether uh, a remedy in a decree has been fully effective in restoring competition. And then, and then providing some, some basis or launching pad for determining that the decree is no longer necessary, it should be modified in some ways, or it should be, um, it is still necessary, and then maybe go for some structural relief and get rid of all the behavioral, you know, behavioral stuff. Um, I know you mentioned something about uh, we should be concerned about um, what foreign enforcers take from what we do with remedies. Do you want to expand on that, that a little bit? Well, it wasn't that long ago that we were really the only antitrust game in town. Uh, that, that certainly uh, changed, particularly after the fall of, of the Berlin Wall. Um, my, my concern is that we have a uh, robust consumer welfare standard here in the United States. And when you go abroad, the phrase consumer welfare is used, but it's just, it's just not the case. Uh, the European Commission uh, uh, views competitors as important as consumers, which is, is fundamentally different from the way we look at it uh, here. So uh, when we are having conduct remedies, which seems to be the European Commission's uh, you know, uh, favorite uh, thing to, to try to do, um, I think we need to be very careful about, you know, how is this going to set a precedent for use in, in Europe or in Asia or in other areas? I, I, I think the number of cases where you would want to rethink a remedy because of the international blowback are, 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 are few, uh, but I think the issue is sufficiently important that it ought to be looked at, uh, particularly in, in for transnational companies. Um, I'm curious whether or not you think that the the equation is different for smaller agencies around the world with respect to structural versus behavioral remedies. I heard one agency uh, of a very small jurisdiction say that we know that all the structural remedies will be done by the big guys and we're going to be doing the sort of specific behavioral remedies to deal with our small problem in our small jurisdiction. Any thoughts on that? Well, I, I think if you did uh, an up and down analysis of those, you would see a tremendous amount of protectionism from the, the smaller companies <laughs> trying to uh, you know, protect, protect particular companies rather than consumers uh, there. And so I, I view those with some skepticism going in. There's a rent extraction problem there too, <laughs> as we all know. <laughs> Yeah, I think the I think the public interest for consumer welfare standard is really important. If the decree is going to be used for purposes of you know protecting a collective bargaining agreement on jobs in you know, South Africa or something like that, that's a very different situation than the sort of consumer welfare standard that we're trying to promote. Absolutely. Yeah. David, I'm going to add quickly. I think. Uh, you know, what we do here matters uh, uh, across the, the world, and, and they are watching. And I think that sometimes they, their incentives are obviously different, I think, from time to time. Uh, I think also, too, they may not or uh, may not want to understand how our s system is different in the sense of judicial review, the fact that, you know, settlements are not, you know, precedent, official precedent sending, and so I think, you know, the, the enforcers need to think of that. Um, I, someone had told me, I, I had read, I think uh, Maureen Olhausen had commented, uh, that when she was in China, uh, someone had said, wow, I didn't realize the U.S. had such a, you know, kind of definitive view on essential facilities. And she said, well, what, you know, that's not, that's not really the case. What do you mean by that? And, and they quoted the Bosch consent decree, uh, uh, an MMI consent decree, as evidence that that was, you know, kind of set, you know, U.S. jurisprudence. Uh, and I think, you know, does that, you know, what does that mean? I think you have to, you know, think about that as an enforcer, what that, what that might do, and, and you know, obviously, whether you agree or disagree with those cases, uh, you know, the, the question is whether when you're describing kind of the remedy and what you're doing, making sure that you set the proper context so that, you know, the international crew, maybe they don't care and they're going to use it anyway, but I think that's a real, that's a real downside. I think on that point, I mean, one of the uh, reasons that, that we've been advocating, you know, structural remedy where there is one to solve a problem because it's certain and it lets the markets uh, gets that markets back in charge is that when you do have and you start getting into 
the behavioral remedies. Uh, sometimes, if you're not exercising the humility that you, Jeff, Maureen, George, and others have uh, espoused, uh, is that you could have a tendency to get into areas uh, that have nothing to do with the actual competition, nor something that you would otherwise get with a successful litigation. And you start creeping into other policy setting goals that we, whether whatever your personal views might be, um, could begin dictating that might not be the statutory mandate for an antitrust law enforcement agency. And there was an example I cited recently dealing with you know, refrigeration and a chicken farm someplace um, is the type of thing that isn't a good idea for us to do. But businesses would be delighted to offer those types of things in order to get a deal through if that becomes the holdup that we do because we have the power to do so. So we need to be very careful not to engage in that. And that is most dangerous when you're doing it in a behavioral context and say, look, I'd like, you know, John, you're creating Coke. I'd like you to have a Macon labeled Coke. Uh, and that's going to be, you know, 20% of your market share. Will you agree? Sure, we'll agree. You get your deal through. Uh, and it's not the appropriate role, except for in that case. So. Uh, Bob, is there any? Dorothy? Do we have any final general thoughts? This has been incredibly uh, helpful. This is an area that's important. Uh, we have huge segments of the population. Almost every consumer is affected by some of these consent decrees. Certainly anybody who uh, cares about music roles, that's a subject of our consent decrees, um, or bicycle brakes, or likes to watch a movie every now and then, or listens to any kind of music is affected by what we are doing and what we will do down the road. Who should do them? And what are the effects uh, you know, in lieu of some of these uh, consent decrees? And what should we do down the road, more importantly, than anything we'll do uh, retrospectively? Uh, but any closing thoughts you would have, I'd welcome uh, you to share that with us now. Uh, and anybody in the public who would like to continue to submit any thoughts or statements for the record of this, uh, we, we continue to welcome that. Eric. Macon, I just want to say that you know it's fantastic that the division is is looking at these issues, and I know these are not the only uh, issues that you're looking at, but you're taking a lot of you know perceived wisdom from the past and and giving it a hard look, and uh, I think that's a fantastic thing. And on on at least on behalf of of myself and the ABA, thank you for uh, launching this project. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for your input. Meredith. Yeah, um, I think just to sort of echo what John said, you know, we're very appreciative that you're uh, having this broad dialogue about all these very difficult discussions. And I think probably the one thing we all agree on is that there's no simple answer, which is a particularly unsatisfying result, I know, especially when you get a lot of folks with many opinions in one room. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, no, this all comes down to differentiations in markets and particular products that have certain systemic issues. Um, and I think that, you know, the fact that we can have these discussions is very heartening um, and that we can have them in good faith uh, and that fundamentally we can all agree that this is something that uh, does need a, a much harder, longer look, especially when you're dealing with very long-term consent decrees such as, again, ASCAP and BMI. Um, so yeah, just to reiterate, um, you know, we're very grateful to be included in this and hope to keep working with folks uh, moving forward as we look at these. Thank you very much. Diana. Um, so again, thank you for inviting us here and for holding these incredible uh, conversations. Uh, they're very helpful to the advocacy community, I'm sure as well to enforcers and to, um, to the antitrust community more broadly and the business community. Uh, the antitrust laws are here to support uh, open and free markets, which is a fundamental uh, underpinning uh, to our economy and uh, very much incorporates democratic values. Um, uh, enforcement of the antitrust laws is vital. Vigorous enforcement of the laws is vital for protecting consumers, uh, entrepreneurs, innovators, uh, everything that makes our market system work. Um, 
Antitrust enforcement, we believe, works best uh, in the frame of law enforcement and with optimal deterrence in mind. Structural remedies are, are, are uh, uh, generally to be preferred in achieving that goal. They're, a, they're, a quick, they're not a quick fix, but they are a one-time fix. And then enforcers can go off and, and open new investigations and look into other types of concerns and conduct. Uh, behavioral remedies don't achieve that for the agencies. They tie them up in a monitoring and regulatory function. Uh, finally, I would just say that in moving forward with this project, um, I think we've seen here today that there are some very, very different consents prevent, present very, very different types of problems and concerns. And there has to be a way to develop a framework to triage what is, you know, what these consents look like. And, and I hate to say buckets, but what potential buckets they, they fall in. Uh, because this is a, a lot, this is, this is uh, resource intensive, for sure. Uh, and the division has limited resources, as we know. And, um, uh, but to the extent that this process uh, gives the division better tools to engage in better enforcement, more vigorous enforcement, more creative enforcement moving forward to protect markets and consumers, then we would heartily, um, heartily endorse that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? George. Yeah, rather than to try to uh, repeat what Diana has already uh, said so well, um, just like to um, um, echo my thanks for being invited and being a part of this discussion. Um, I uh, No doubt there's a lot of underbrush that can be cleared out. I think the uh, review that you're doing is uh, a good one. Uh, I hope you'll uh, save all of the ones that need saving and uh, improve the ones that could stand some improving, and uh, we look forward to working with you on that. Thank you very much. Hey, AAG John, just want to thank you for uh, letting us participate on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce. This is a fantastic discussion, and uh, we look forward to further dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Yes, thank you again for the invitation. Uh, Open Marcus is pleased to be here and to continue engaging with the department. Um, just two quick points uh, that dovetail very closely with those that Diana made is that first, oftentimes the upfront costs of litigation can yield savings uh, in the future. And I believe a lot of this uh, relates to the point that Mr. Eisenach had made uh, regarding sort of decision theory and type one and type two errors. And I do just want to point out one thing is that embedded in that framework, although it sounds neutral, is the idea that markets are contestable and that they can self-correct over time. In some cases, this is true. But over time, as we've seen, as certain markets have become more concentrated, this is less and less the case. So I do think that there is a harm to under deterrence, and in that case, imposing anti antitrust laws first uh, is a way to stall economic concentration. Thank you. It's certainly more true in those markets that are not regulated that limit the entry of new entrants and new innovation. So the freer the markets are, and that's ultimately, uh, hopefully, our goal. Well, not. Brian, th thank you for that, and, and it set up exactly what I wanted to say, and just very, which I will keep extremely brief. Um, the great thing about antitrust is that we all gather here uh, within kind of a generally agreed upon framework of analysis and debate over points like that and evidence based uh, uh, and, and bring evidence to the table. And you know that isn't necessarily the way policy making works in other areas uh, of government. So it's great to be able to sit with a group of thoughtful people and have a substantive discussion. Um, none of us is perfectly right, but we all learn from it. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I think you're doing a great thing by organizing this. So thank you. Uh, thank you again. Let me just remind everybody that uh, May 31st is our third uh, roundtable, and it's on anti-competitive regulations, uh, both federal and state. And we welcome uh, public commentary on this. Uh, you know, these things could be state bars. It could be medical licensing boards. Uh, that somehow limit markets. They could be various regulations. We, you know, you mentioned some in the Department of Transportation. It could be energy, um, telecom. But uh, we have a very active uh, competition advocacy role in the financial services and other areas where we have provided comments. We continue to do that. We're doing it in a mo much more robust way. We're uh, filing statements of interest in private actions around the country. Uh, you've noticed the one down in Florida against the Florida Bar for limiting uh, the technology company because they're practicing law, but it's really competition for folks like us, lawyers, um, that they'd like to limit. 
and we've expressed you know our views on the limits of uh, the state action doctrine and other immunities but uh, we would welcome the public comment and continued participation like this in a great dialogue so i thank you for that uh, and thank you for being here today Thanks.